Yeah, certainly we were hit harder than most. Um, there were 3,000 retailer uh, retail stores that were affected, 300 banks, so 3,300 stores in total. In total, we had 438 stores. So about 13% of the total damage to the retail industry happened in our portfolio. Um, we were, yeah, really in the thick of it. Um, and given the fact that the reach of the business interview I did with Alec on the Thursday uh, in, of that week of hell had over 40,000 views, I'm sure that a lot of you may have seen it already, so I'm not going to rehash what I did there. Um, what I am going to do today is to take you through the, what, what we saw as 72 hours of anarchy, um, Monday the 12th through to Wednesday the 14th, um, of July and what happened amongst those 72 hours. We had six sh of our own shopping centers that were, were significantly damaged. Um, and it's important to understand that shopping centers are not just brick and mortar. They are organic living uh, creatures almost. They take a lot to get them going and take a lot to get them to keep them going. So instead of going straight into it, I thought it's best to give you a little bit of a background on the six shopping centers that were damaged. Um, Chris Honey Crossing uh, was on the NCA for, a, for two days as they dismantled and looted, looted it. Um, it was our flagship, developed in 2010. Um, developed in 2010 after the, the GFC, we raised the money in, in 2009 um, and we put up 100% of the funding. We had a 34%, uh, or we had a 50% partnership of which 34% was black owned. Um, and we literally had to cross collateralize everything we had as a family to raise the funding in 2010 or 29, 2009 to, to build this. Um, and it took us, yeah, it took us three, four years to, to, to put that all together. Um, and as I say, it was a, it was a 41,000 square meter shopping center in, in Chris Honey, in Foss Lewis. Um, there you can see beautiful roofs, a lot of PV panels on it. Um, and unfortunately, about 60 million rands worth of damage was caused to that. Um, the second mall that um, I'm going to chat about quickly, Great Edendale Mall. P Peter Marisburg was incredibly heavily hit. Um, this is without a doubt our worst hit development. This one was a 50-50 development with Nandi Mandela and her new ground investments. Um, we again raised the funding for, for the 50% um, BE partners, and this one has always been totally destroyed. Uh, the engineers have condemned about 80-85% of it, and it looks like it's actually cheaper to knock it down and start again. About 2,150 jobs currently are outstanding, uh, and Google, as Google Earth is, if you look here, this is post. If you can look at all the, the roofs there, those are the extents of the fires um, that were, were lit inside, and, I, and I'll talk a bit more about that one uh, when we get there. Uh, the next development, uh, Diplo Square, opened in 2012. Um, this one, interestingly, 60% um, BEE. We were only the 40%, uh, including an 8% community trust. Um, in Diplo Extension, it's kind of like the Beverly Hills of Soweto was actually the least damaged out of all of ours. Um, the, the next two are, are, are local. Teku Plaza, which is between Madadeni or Sazueni, Newcastle. Uh, that opened in August 2013. There's a Kenny Plaza outside Lady Smith, um, October 2013. Um, kind of the tale of two cities, really. Teku Plaza, ready for a massive upgrade. It's got the strongest trading shop right in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and literally 80 k's away is a Kenny. Uh, outside Lady Smith, really, really battling. It wasn't put into the fund, yeah, into the fund exemplar REIT that we, we listed on the JSC in, in 2018, because it had about 20% vacancies. The, we've really been battling to keep our tenants, and this is, to be honest, one of the ones where our CFO is actually saying to us, do we go back? Um, despite my, all my positivity on Alex's talk, um, we don't know if the tenants are going to come back to be honest, um, following this, we've already had Capitec pull, pull out of it. So it's a big thing is you can say you can, you can rebuild it, you can rebuild the brick and mortar, but the value is in the leases, the value is in the income streams, um, and we don't know if we can, we can re-secure them. Teku Plaza on the left-hand side, there's a Kenny um, on, on the right-hand side. And then the last one that was damaged that we will get to, that I want you to meet, is, is Mandini Mall. Uh, this was a 50-50 partnership with the, the local black um, landowner who used to run a goat and cattle trading operation on the store, uh, on, that, um, on that land. 
with about 11,000 square meters, um, and this was the one that we were c concerned about, and this was the first one to go um, in the in the 48 hours, the 72 hours of anarchy. Um, an interesting slide I just wanted to show you, just in terms of of, of all of them, um, the, the vast majority of them. Uh, significant BEE shareholding in all of them on opening. The only one is Akeni Plaza. Uh, it's actually the only development I've ever done that we haven't partnered with local uh, or black um, landowners in the beginning, and lucky for them, because we've had to feed the bond over the years, and we, we have spent an inordinate amount of money um, you know, paying down that, because the revenue hasn't been sufficient to actually pay off the, off the bond. So... Um, other than that, um, all of them have had significant uh, black shareholding. Uh, the second part of it is the number of, you know, a big part of what we do is empowering local business. And so in terms of number of keys, you can look there, 35, 47, 44, 33, 57, 43 percent of the number of stores are owned by historically disadvantaged individuals, local mom and pop businesses. And this for me is where the entire thing gets really difficult because for me meeting after the events meeting all, all the all the tenants you get to meet these tenants that have put their entire life savings into these businesses and are supporting their families they're employing numerous people um, and so for me that's the big driver that we have to get these things things back um, to get all these these developments back we start our story at 40 hours to, to anarchy. Um, I was in Limpopo on the game reserve, on a game reserve. It was eight o'clock in the morning, and we got our first message um, that something was brewing. And this was on the Saturday, it would have been the Saturday the 10th um, of July. In planning this um, speech, this was my screen time report from the next Saturday, um, up to over 10, 10 hours a day on WhatsApp, and that includes the second half of the week, which wasn't nearly as busy as the 72 hours of anarchy. I anticipate I was probably on about 18 hours on those first three days, and that gave me the idea for the format of this. Um, what I'm doing today is I'm taking you inside my WhatsApp group. I'm taking you inside our Exemplar Operations WhatsApp group, which is the most sanitized of all the WhatsApp groups because it's got the executives. There's no laughing cap videos or anything that's posted on there. It's only things that really happen. Uh, of importance to the executive. On average, that, um, that WhatsApp group averages about 10 to 20 uh, messages a day. Um, and so what I've done is I've actually put a counter of the number of, because I can't take you through the whole WhatsApp group, we've, we've turned it into a PowerPoint, um, and you'll just see how the number of WhatsApps, just literally, just how much stuff was happening at any one time. Um, so as I say, we start on Saturday the 10th of July, 7.58, um, with my brother sent through the first, the first poster, um, the shutdown KZN, uh, Dan Danhauser Shell, Shell Garage, a, a Zuma thing. We, we discounted it because we were all so fatigued by the entire Zuma incarceration saga and everything else. We knew that there was going to be rumblings, and I don't think we really saw it was coming. We, you know, just said, ah, you know, just more noise, more noise, more noise. Um, by 11.14 a.m. on that same day, we got this voice note. Leaders, 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 leaders. This is a reminder. Grand Kumbulene with Monday, he shut down. He shut down. He organized all cultural, cultural forums, business associations, indunas, amabuto, na all community leaders around a cultural. Gala, please, leaders, inform your families, friends, colleagues, my neighbors. With the, on Monday. It's a shutdown as Gijelwa. And what's important about that is what Gigi picked up at Zamabuto, the um and, and the Enduna. This there were calls at the the hostels that uh, we knew that things were coming behind it coming at us from the hostels and at 1218 on that same day. We got this from one of our center managers. Everyone is paranoid. This protest is going to be big and there are criminal leaders at its head. And this was the first indication that we had that this was not going to be just political. There was a criminal element to this, as we will, as we will see. And I've brought that slide up again, because in terms of that service delivery forum, there are a number of known criminals alleged to, to be running behind that. 
Next, the next series of messages you already see is starting to run. We're already on, uh, if you look at the top left, the, the WhatsApp count already at 30. Uh, so three times already what the average is on a day. Uh, we had to close Mandini Mall on the North Coast. Um, at 21.14, near Kabukweni and Emoyeni, outside in Bombela in El uh, there was tires burning. Um, and at... Alexander gathered in the streets uh, at uh, just before midnight on that Saturday, and as was mentioned, this uh, some, um, p p PT or whatever it was, this was the Af African soil. There was the first indications of the stuff was getting serious um, in Alexandra. We had just finished we about four years ago. Alex Mall, the biggest mall in Alexandra, and obviously we were then wary that thing. This was not just going to be KZN; it was going to be Gauteng as well. By Sunday, um, we had credible information. There's 40 WhatsApps on the Sunday um, of that Phosphorus, Soweto, Daviton, Molota Road, which we've got two big malls, Paula and Quaha Mall, Attridgeville and uh, Illuminate Bush, Alexandra, Tembisa were all under threat and that we had to we had to start to mobilize. What I've done now is I have just said that you can see this rolling thunder. We put it onto a map and you'll see as we go through the WhatsApps, as we go through the various things, you will see icons come up saying that we are closing, that we have got fires, we've been breached. Just so that you guys can see how this thing literally moved from time, you know, already on 49 WhatsApps um, by 1420. Um, we, had, we got intel to, that we had to increase security at Chris Honey Crossing in Fosley Risk. Uh, we had to close by just before four o'clock. The crowds were starting to gathering. By four o'clock, we had to increase security at Teku Plaza outside Newcastle. We had to increase security at quarter past four at Izakeni outside Lady Smith. We, by 1618, and this is the irony of it, this is Deepcliff Square. My head of operations sends me photos, and inside those photos are our revamp of Deepcliff Square. And he says, I can't wait, we're excited to see the center revamp. So whilst all of this was going on, um, basically South Africa was about to burn and that was about to include Dipcliffe Square as well. At three minutes past five, um, and I've taken out the numbers, the, the names of the people obviously for, for poppy reasons, for security reasons and everything else. Um, but just received a call from SAPS, the leasing has started, Tembisa Plaza, Tembisa Plaza, one of the developments that we, we developed in Tembisa um, on Andrew Mapetra Drive and sold to the PIC. Um, and we then knew that Tembisa was likely also be at risk. Just before seven o'clock, now Lady Mall in Fossilis, not too far from our Chris Harney Crossing, where it was hit and breached. Um, and at seven o'clock, down in Newcastle, down that side there, um, the, the looting had started in North Zizweni, which is just to the kind of north, north uh, east of, of, of Tegu Plaza. 1907, uh, we deployed extra guards to, um, to Alex Mall, I'm sorry, and, and we got the first photos of the damage at N Naledi. And Monday midnight is when I start my timeline of the 72 hour, hours of anarchy, and the anarchy for us began. My first message came through. I wasn't awake. I was I was sleeping in in, in rural and Popa. But at at 24 minutes past um, 12, the security was overpowered at Mandini Mall on the north coast of Durban. Uh, if you look down there, that's where Mandini is. Um, and we got the first messages now of the crowds um, com coming into us. Uh, the looters were shooting at our security at Mendini. Uh, the message came in at, at, at half past 12, and we heard that the Plessisla Saps, which is where our Indal Mall is, were, were on strike, and we were unlikely to get any SAP support um, from there. At another four minutes later, another message came in uh, that the uh, over the road from Edendale Mall, Edendale Crossing had been looted. Uh, they had tried to they had tried to enter our centre. Our security shot uh, shot warning shots and whatnot, were able to dissuade them from coming in at, for, for that time. By 1.50, 101 uh, WhatsApp messages had come through, the, come through the WhatsApp. Our perimeter fencing at Teku, Teku again in, in Madadeni or Sizweni, uh, down there, our, our, our perimeter fencing had been cut. By 1.50, uh, our Edendale had now been properly breached. They'd, uh, they had looted the routes. Um, and importantly, apparently heavy armed saps has fled. Absolutely no, 
And then at, if you look at the timestamps there at 4.44, the photos of the mass looting that was then going on in, at Edendale in Peter Maritzburg. By 3.10, we got further pictures from Edendale, and one of the questions I've got from my, my guys is why the hell did we leave the lights on so that they could loot in uh, in, in in the lights? So the, you know, sunflower oil and 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 taking the lights off is is obviously something to consider going forward. Um, I was now I was now driving down from um, back. I, t I turned a six and a half hour drive into five hours um, to get back to head office from Limpopo, and it's. And at 6.22, we received the first visuals of our Indel Mall um, burning. And obviously, it's, it's a heartbreaking thing to see if you know what goes into getting these shopping centers working. Um, and and Edendale was never an easy one for us to, 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 to keep burning, uh, to keep working. To see it burning like this, that's a proper fire. Um, they had pumped so much petrol into very, these various stores. There was no intention just to loot. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. It was maximum damage. There was, they were looking to cause economic havoc, effectively. So let me just go on now. Um, 125 SMSs or WhatsApps. At 6.36, we got um, f further information, further fires. Um, and this was a commentary that continued. They were cutting our hose reels off at, at the drums. They were stealing them. They were extinguishing our fire extinguishers. They were damaging our, 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 our water um, supply. So we had absolutely no way to put out these fires. We tried to get the fire department there. They couldn't come out. Why? Because there's the comment. They won't come in without a SAPS escort, and SAPS have given us the middle finger. That is verbatim from, from, from the thing. And unfortunately, as, as I said on Alex's thing, we were just sitting back and watching the bright this time. I was driving back in my car. I was phoning the forestry choppers to see if they could come and water bomb this to try and help us put out the fires. They weren't allowed to do such, do, do anything. But be that as it may, um, you know, we, we realized we had something quite big on our hands. By 6.56, uh, the looting had started in Davidson on the East Rand, um, with the where they hit the Davidson Mall, not our the one that we manage yet, Mayfield Square. The fence was completely destroyed just before seven o'clock on the Monday. Remember, this is we're only seven hours in, into the anarchy, guys. And if you if you look at the bottom here, um, I've got little time bars. If you're watching a, a, a YouTube video. Um, so that red bar will just track this where we are in the 72 hours, and sometimes it's unfathomable to think how much went on in certainly the first the, the first 24 hours. But you can just keep watching watching that to see how far we are, are in it. We've got the first photos of the damage at at Mandini Mall at Hopper Seven, with the information that the looters were still looming. Uh, we knew that, that certainly they weren't done with it, and it was amazing how brazen it was that they were doing it in the light of day. Um, this, this image helped me uh, very much talk my way out of the traffic police. I'd been, as I said, turned a, a six and a half hour car drive into to five hours, and you don't do that by driving at 120. Um, and I was pulled over, and I managed to show this video. This is Brookside Mall in Peter Maritzburg, and I showed it to the cops saying, guys, this is Edendale, this is Brookside, they're burning our shopping centers, I need to get to head office and they let me go. Um, and I was very, very pleased for that. Um, and this, I then, after seeing this, I actually got hold of, of, of ShopRite because I was told that we had looming threats in, in Fosseris and I needed to shut down that center. And ShopRite, uh, alongside a lot of other tenants, I get upset when, I, when we shut them down for COVID or whatever other reasons, because they lose trade. And I, and I phoned ShopRite and I, said, and I said to the guys, listen, I'm going to have to shut down Foster Risk. And he said to me, Jason, shut them down. We have got over 50 ShopRites that have already been dis destroyed. And what I heard thereafter was frightening. He said, we had tactical teams being arrested in KZN by the police on their way out to protect some of our assets. So that was the first time we were like, well, who the hell do we trust if we cannot trust the SAPs? And this was created this immense amount of disquiet within ourselves because we had all this information. We had, we've got intel in the communities um, telling us what's going to happen. And now we're feeding it to the SAPs. Are we feeding it to the right SAPs or to the wrong SAPs? I don't really know if there are the right SAPs, the wrong SAPs. I'm not military trained. I'm not in intelligence. But this was what's going through your mind. You know, you're a businessman. And now you're dealing with who the hell do you trust? It was a frightening time, um, to be honest. We get to 741. Um, this is the message from, from Mendinimo. 
Um, Cops, no rubber bullets or, or tear gas, which obviously would have helped. Uh, they, they were shooting at the feet of them. This did keep the, the mob at bay for a while, but that didn't last very long. Um, we now, it's not even 8 o'clock yet, almost 200 messages. Um, and I sent out a message to, to my teams to shut down. Uh, any, any, anywhere, any shopping center, irrespective, shut down because we saw we saw the the rising momentum as this thing was building. As this thing was building, we realized that we were in for a, a hell of a day. Um, and I, and I instructed any center manager that had any credible threat that we were to to shut down. Um, by eight o'clock, this is when business is supposed to start in the day, huh? and we've already seen all of this. Um, we got the first information from some of the guys. There seems to be an evil element to this. It looks like they're throwing petrol bombs. We then realized this wasn't just about looting. This, there was, this was something far more sinister. Um, and they're inside tech with, they're busy looting tech with, they're inside. That was a voice note from our center manager who you could hear was emotionally distraught. 300 people inside Teku, Teku's Madadenios is really outside Newcastle. Um, we realized that one had now been breached and was and was done at, at 9 30 uh, we had to close social and Groovy plaza just north of pretoria uh, we 9 51 we had threats at alex 10 04 we had um th threats at thorn tree again in, in another one of ours in social in social and Groovy. 10 41 we had to close dipco there were no saps in in attendance by 11:05, 189 whatsapp so far is a kenny was breached uh, outside lady smith 11.33, Teku Plaza, we got the first photos of our shoppers um, walking through, through the parking lot. So as you can see, that's just mayhem and chaos there. 11.36, um, message from uh, my center manager at Edendale. And just saying, you know, security ran, ran out of bullets uh, and the police can't get to the site because they've barricaded every, everything. Um, and these are some images we picked up off social media of the, the, the looting um, at, at Isakeni, um, with them literally having stolen the cash pool, Jojo tanks, and literally overrunning everything. That's the uh, typical burning fires outside um, the plaza to create the distraction and everything else. That's not the roots burning yet. The roots was only burnt, burnt a little bit later. Um, 194 by 1242. Um, the looters started to attend, uh, to enter Mayfield Square, which is Davidson on the East Rand. One o'clock, um, we realized we couldn't carry on waiting for saps. And so we started throwing every resource we had. And this was the a tweet that came from my center manager in, in Olivenhout Bush, that it, that was every single private security that we could muster at the time because everyone was getting pulled everywhere. Um, but certainly it was nice to have that kind of a show of force uh, by quarter past. One, Deep Close Square in Soweto, we had our first shots fired at our security, um, and that message came through then. Already over 200 messages. One quarter to two in the afternoon, we had to close down Alex Moore because of the threats. At five to two, um, the messages came through from, from our center manager at Deep Close that they were trying to get in. SAPS was on site, but they hadn't been assisting, uh, and they had now got in, and they had vand vandalized the root school, which was the closest one to the, to the gates. And then a frightening message, uh, which we had been expecting, because we expected, because of the hostels that did, and that Chris Harney crossing, there are calls from our underground people that there's a momentum to go to Chris Harney. We had been waiting for this, we expected it, we anticipated, and we knew that we were gonna come hard at us at Chris Harney. And then there was a message at that same time that is Deep Cliff Square in, in Foster West with all the looters now inside um, and, and doing their shopping. Another fighting message at 10 minutes to three. They're prepping petrol bombs first in the hostels for Sam and Julie, which is the Katlahong shopping center, plus Chris, Chris Harney crossing. Um, and, and there's an image of um, that went viral. This was actually in Peter Marisburg. But if anyone thought that this wasn't, you know, there wasn't petrol involved, this was the, the day before they started in Edendale, um, guys filling up containers um, of petrol that was going to then be used in the, in, 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 in the petrol bombs. At two minutes to three, we realized it, was getting, it wasn't just in the townships. Um, there were stoning cars on Republic Road near, near William Nickel, um, and I took the, the decision to, to shut down our office and send everyone home because I, we, we didn't, you know, and the, the great thing about COVID, it taught us how to, how to be remote. And so for the rest of the time, I shut down the office, we all went, we bunkered down, and we kept um, 
on, on our WhatsApp, we kept on our various security groups uh, and managed it from basically from our homes. I didn't want any of our, our ladies driving with all of this going on. We've got a lot of people who work for us in Pretoria who come from Joburg. Uh, and if obviously from my side, my, our people are our primary concern, so I had to, to shut down with all of this going on, shut down the office. At 11 past three, Deep Cliff in Soweto was breached. Um, security responded with gunshots and surprisingly, oh wait, and then I posted this, that the president was to address the nation that evening on the violence with everything burning. We couldn't wait. We wanted to hear what the president was to, had to say um, that evening because literally everything was burning. Uh, at quarter past four, Kabukweni, um, just outside in Bombela in the, the top there, um, that got, that got um, breached. But fortunately, we managed to, to repel them. At, at half past two, Tembisa Plaza was breached. Tembisa Plaza, one that we built, we no longer owned. Um, and then we got some photos of that. I'm going to play a quick voice note. This is our center manager uh, voice note, a, a video clip. Our center manager in Deep Cliff. And what he had to say, let me just get to it. We did have a rest at Deep Cliff, which, which was fantastic. Um, and that was actually the only time that the SAPs really helped. It took, it took them 20 minutes to get there and actually um, arrest the people. It didn't stop the looting over the next few days, though. But at least there was some action by the, by, by the police. Very emotional interview with him. You know, from uh, the Deep Cliff Police Department, they were very broken. Because what I've seen that our own people have done is it's very, very, very sad. You know, uh, our own property that we have to just come walking to go and buy whatever that we need. It's so, it's, it's, it is damaged. So we have to spend more. And the consulate, I can see that you know the calculations that we are going to do now. It's, it's, it's millions of friends. Mm. People have lost their jobs at the moment. Mm. So you know what next? Mm. Because you know, people will just to walk, you know, inside the common bar. But at the moment you have not to go to South Gate. Mm. You have to go to Mola Park, you have to go to Central, you have to go to West Gate. Mm. Instead of the money that you could have bought, you know, taking a taxi to West Gate, you could buy next to yourself. You know, to what it's made. The people who are looking here, it's not people from those of air not from here. It's our own people. Not, not very easy to hear, but what he's saying, he is broken, he is, he is, he is hurt by the fact that it's the very community that we are serving that has just done this to us, and it was a, a continuous theme as we went through. Um, at by 20 to 5, Teku Plaza was now on fire, um, and yeah, it was a, this was a, actually, the, the video was taken a little bit later, but this just shows you can hear the, the glass breaking as, it, as it's going. Um, and we, we didn't get to see the full extent of the damage here until a couple of days later when it had calmed down and we were able to get in there. But obviously, as you, as you can imagine, it's, it's, it, it gets quite heavy because these things are emotional. You, you built them up from, from grassroots, you, from, from green fields up to this, and then you're literally just seeing them getting dismantled. What takes you 10, 15 years to, to put together um, being dismantled in, in, in the course of a couple of hours. Um, but there were a lot of positives, um, and and certainly the the community came to Chris Honey Crossing and Foster Risk. They, they they got around. They came to try and protect it. Um, Chris Honey hadn't been breached yet. We knew that it was going to be breached by five o'clock. The the Kabukweni Plaza gate was broken in Bombela, but the Saps and the taxis had started to to arrive to assist us by quarter past five. There were threats at Emoyeni Mall, also close to. Um, Close to close from Bombella, um, again, the, the, the SAPs were on site again. So nice to see a change in the different province uh, of Mpumalanga. By 1720, the Kabukweni situation is getting very bad. They took out our gate, and as you can see there, getting worse now. Um, police shooting and the taxi drivers are assisting us. So this would become a theme that really helped us turn the tide as we, we, we got, got through this thing later on in, in, on this day. Look at that, 280 messages on a, on, on a WhatsApp group that normally only has 10 to 20 um, in, a, in a day. It was absolute mayhem. At, by five minutes to six, we got our first shots of, of Visit Kenny Plaza, one of them, without a doubt, the weakest center in our portfolio. And I put it in here because our head of leasing 
said, this hurts. And this didn't hurt because it was our flagship. This hurt because we have got the highest percentage of local tenants that have been struggling and battling and put their life savings into this. And we knew that this was going to hurt those people. And it, because it's a difficult center for us to manage, it really, that was for me, without a doubt, the most emotional one to go, despite the fact it being the smallest of all of them that, that, that was to go. Um, we'll keep going. This is, is, uh, this is the, the um, Edendale. We got the, the video at Hopper 6. Um, and this was the video of the inside. The first we got of the inside of what the inside of our mall looked like. This is our centre manager trying not to get seen to be videoing it uh, because obviously there were still people around. But as you can see, an absolute annihilation, absolute destruction. Um, and as as I said, over ninety percent has now been con condemned by the by the engineers due to the sheer extent of the of the fires that we had there. Um, by eighteen thirty four. Um, we got this photograph of Teku Plaza, um, and what's important about this one, I find, is that fire is not burning because there's anything combustible on the, the, the cladding. That's petrol bombs that have been thrown at, 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 at the signage, at, at the, um, and that's actually the roots. You can actually just see it. So that's obviously the, the result of the petrol bombs, and as I said, it was the continuation of the, of the theme um, that we had. 343 messages by quarter, 20 past, past seven that evening. Uh, looters overpowered uh, saps at Mayfield Square. Square Mayfield Square was breached, um, which is uh, in, in Davidson. And then finally, as expected, by 20 past nine, our flagship Chris Honey Crossing went down. Um, they breached. Um, and the comment, Metro and saps on site, but not doing anything, not engaging, not firing shots. What is the point? And um, we didn't, at that stage, really know how to, uh, where to turn. 20 past nine, we heard that the presidential, I posted the presidential address was delayed to 2030. We were all obviously very hopeful that something would come out of it. And after the address, there were only two comments out of 350 by now that were made regarding the president's address. So we all said a whole lot of nothing. They will set up meetings to discuss tomorrow, fiddling while Rome burns. Obviously, we felt like we had been left in the lurch whilst everything we'd been trying to do, there was literally now had no idea where do we turn. The SAPS wasn't giving us sufficient support. And this effectively set up what broke the back of this thing for us. Um, remember by 10 past nine, we had, that was the seventh center of ours that had got lost six of which we own, one which, which, which we manage, we didn't lose another one. And we didn't lose another one because of what happened this night. Uh, they attempted to breach at Attridgeville at 20 past nine. Uh, we managed to repel them. Attridge is, is just west of Pretoria. 20 past 10, uh, they started at Sakani, 32,000 square meters shopping center of ours. Uh, fortunately, we had good uh, SANDF support there. Uh, and then this is where everything changed. The, moot, the looters started mobilizing Alec, Alec, in Alex Mall. Um, this is, maybe Gigi was part of this. Uh, this is uh, at Elevenhout Bosch. And this is some of the support we had at Elevenhout Bosch, um, which was for me wonderful to see. After being left in the lurch by the saps everywhere, you had this kind of support um, protecting us at, at, um, at Elevenhout Bush. So, and Elevenhout Bush didn't go down because we had this kind of support. So it was, it was actually nice. It wasn't saps everywhere that weren't able to support us. Um, they were certainly able to do their um, a tweet saying at the back of Tsukani, crowd surrounding Alex. Uh, Bambanani Shopping Centre, Dip Slurt, which Gigi talked about, is having trouble at, at Hopless 9 on the Monday night. And then from Chris Honey Crossing, cops and military have totally left us, and there's a fire on the shop right side. 359 tweets, and it's only Hoppus 9. The looters started mobilizing at Alex Mall again. Uh, by that stage, Alex Mall was the only mall left standing in, in Alexandra. The rubber bullets were fired at Sakani, there was a message. Um, community members and SAPs arrived to protect Sakani Mall. We had a lot of communities saying, this is Modi Mole, uh, communities refusing to join the looting, coming, forming human chains around a lot of the assets that did stand. Um, Pumalanga residents stepped up to protect our assets in Mpumalanga. Lusiki Siki, um, the Santaka played a huge role in this, um, getting the, the taxi guys to say no to, no to looting in the Lusiki Siki. 
Um, I sent this message at Hopkins 10 on the Monday night. I just spoken to the CEO of Safari, um, who said that he was very much like us. He had just lost three of their malls, um, and but just like us, as things started heating up, SAPs decided to leave their malls. I then got a message from my head of operations, which you know I read it now and it chills me to the bone. When he, he responded, you know, they're three down. He said, we six down and seven and eight close. You know, you take 40 years building up a business and, and you almost 50% of what you've got left is, is, is about to be burnt. Um, it was a hell of a time, I tell you what. Um, so by, let's look at that, 378 WhatsApps by Hop Hoppus 10. Um, that was when the Santaco deputy chairperson sent out his message to protect the malls in the Eastern Cape. Um, we, they were playing with us between us and Sam and Tuli, Katlong and, and Foster Rissa. I was on the, on the line to, to the CEO of Moorman, who owns uh, Sam and Tuli. And it was literally, it was like a ping pong game. They were hitting us this side, hitting us that side, pulling the, the saps um, this way, that way. Um, and, and so I was calling the, the POP, I was calling these, the, the, these, these uh, joint operation control centers that we've been given to try and get them to come back to us. You know, guys, they are literally, they're starting, to just stop them burning, let them loot, let them just try and stop the burning. Um, and that was the report back I got, you know, Pepsor was burning and they started looting inside. That was a big thing. They tried to burn the Afrox bulk gas store. Had that gone, it would have blown the township behind it, it would have decimated. We, literally, when I say we're bulk tanks like that, they put their stacked tires over those bulk tanks outside the cages and set them alight. Fortunately, they didn't go. Otherwise, there would have been a calamitous explosion um, in, in there. And there, there was some images. Now, the, it's all been bad news to now. I think this is when it, this is when it, when it turned um, for us, when we realized we could no longer trust the cops, trust SAPs to, to do anything, and we had to do things ourselves. By 10 to 10, our security at Chris Honey Crossing had uh, run out of ammo, uh, and they had to leave, and we decided, those that they've breached, we can do no more. Let's focus all our attention in keeping what we have standing. Just before 12 o'clock on Monday night, um, the looters were overpowered at, at Alex Mall. This was them trying to breach us. We had um, security on site. If you look on that video, you can see some of the distraction fires that they've got going there. Um, this is them trying to, to, to come in um, to, to the mall. Um, there were about 2,000 uh, looters. Um, and we think about 25 to 30 heavily armed guys uh, from the muzzle flashes that we were getting there. Good news, uh, we got this just before midnight, that the community was behind us in, 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 um, in Mabupani Square. Uh, guys, I'm, I'm going to play this clip because it's very important. This clip was completely unauthorized by me. Um, this is Leanne from SABC interviewing my center manager on the Thursday about the events that took place now. And it gives you an indication he was there. He was literally the entire night um, at, at Alex on the, on the Monday night. Um, I got this tweet from him at 2.55. Since 6 p.m., war till we won. About 10 combis behind the mall were ready to load. We shot them on top. What they had done was they brought all the guys in, in the, with the long guns, and they were waiting to, once they had breached, to take them away. And what Lucky did, he's ex-military, he decided, listen, and they, they started shooting at the, at the combis, and they chased the combis away. So these guys had no get getaway, and that kind of put them on the back foot. Uh, well, Leon, we, we, we were surprised because these people, these things, it's orchestrated and well organized. You got groups that start this thing as a distraction, but they target ATMs, saves, uh, strong rooms. So on that day when I was called from home, because we got this intel in the community to tell us, so I was called from home. I came here at about 20 to 7. They would start penning the tires behind the mall, surrounding the mall, with 40 kumbis to 50 kumbis, mostly soul speaking, hiding in the yards. So we came in. I spoke to my guys. I said, guys, we got, you have seen everything. You know when they leave a mall, how does it look? It's nothing. It's just a, a, a shell. And we are the only people standing. And what about our communities? 
look, like now you see a crane is coming for medication. We, we can't have a problem in South Africa and extra aid other ones. So I told them, we fight for our community, our life food, and a dignity for our people who work here and stuff that it flows to the community because if these people lose jobs, it affects the community. So we said first we put our community first, our lives will come after. So I, I told them, guys, today we die tonight or we come back with our lives, but the mall must remain standing. Then when we went out, it was at that day we were about eight, the mall security, including me and my partner. And then there were eight SNADF, but they couldn't shoot because their state, their mandate is not to shoot because they are given state-issued bullets. So us as people from here, we had to shoot for ourselves to survive. So we had to help people. So they broke the gates and they broke behind shop right. That's when we saw this is serious. Then that's when we made a small prayer to God forgive us if we're going to kill people or hurt people and we started shooting. And uh, when we were emotional because we only saw the next day being an ash. So that put, motivated us that we can't have an ash here, as you see it standing. So that night we came back with our lives and we achieved. And here it is. You can see for yourself, we are humbled as we see our mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers. Having, it's like we are normal here. It never happened. And this is how we feel now we can walk tall to say, we have served the community of Alexander, and we're still serving it, and we'll serve them forever. Now, so anyone who, who thinks this wasn't all-out warfare, we went through 5,000 rubber bullet rounds that night before they started shooting live, live ammunition when Lucky went and called the, the taxis to come in to help sm smuggle ammunition in and to sh shoot back at them. One of, one of the learnings we realized then was the cops were going to do nothing. We had to take this thing into our own hands. Um, one of the big issues there was we didn't, the people were hidden in the darkness behind. So these guys were just, the lucky and, and, and the taxi guys were literally seeing where the muzzle flashes were coming for and having to shoot back at the muzzle flashes. We didn't know who was coming at us, but all, we were, all you could do is just see the muzzle flashes from all around shooting at the, at the security. For me, that just encapsulates the fact that this was, and I said at the time, this is a state of war. This is not in a state of emergency. We were getting shot at by, by proper, proper ammunition, proper, proper weapons. Um, by 6.24, um, the next morning, as the Kenny Plaza was on fire. Let me just quickly go through there. And by 8 o'clock, you know, we all needed a bit of, uh, of um, a little bit of humor. So someone posted this after seeing the, the highly efficient nature of ISNDF at the time. Um, uh, we, sorry, we caught some agitators at Mull of Timbisa with guns, uh, with Durban registration plates, uh, showing that some people, that people were coming out. Um, the looters were back at Sakani Mall and... Uh, they, they've cut it a bit short, but it, it was just a bit of light humor. It was about the only one of only two humorous things that, ha that happened in the week because we, it, we were just laughing. You know, we had now realized that this was all in our own hands. We had to control what, what was happening. And after we had seen what had happened at Alex, we managed to keep Alex standing by engaging with the taxis. Um, that changed everything uh, for us over the next two days. There was continued looting at Izakeni. I'll just keep pushing through it. Um, by quarter past nine on the Tuesday, Teku Plaza, we got the first photos through um, of the, the absolute devastation, the destruction caused by the fires there. By 10.37, the, photo, the video of the DC, the Fortress DC, which ended up being the UPL um, fertilizer and pesticides that went and poisoned the, the Umschlange Lagoon. Um, the big concern for me was retailability. The, the, the group that had bought out Edgar's as annexed to that. We were worried that was retailability. I just invested alongside um, Norman Drisselman and, and the retailability guys putting in their first new Edgar's into our Mall of Tembisa. And I had suddenly seen that if that was retailability's um, DC, the likelihood of retailability coming back would have a devastating impact on the rebirth of Edgar's. And so we were obviously in extremely frightened by that. We we're very pleased to find out that it wasn't their, their side of it didn't go down. Unfortunately, it leaked all of those chemicals, as I said, into the ecosystem as a consequence of that fire. Um, 
they haven't put in the request to trade, which I think was quite funny. Um, I was asked, we were asked by one of the big retailer groups to, you know, I know we know that, that the, the landlords want to protect their shopping centers, but please do not sh shut down your shopping centers unless you're ordered to do so by the SAPs or SANDF. And I just said, for goodness sake, we have been providing intel to the SAPs a day before they have it, and now I must wait at the behest of SAPs to tell me that I've got a threat. Um, so obviously, quite you know, we didn't even <laughs> bother to respond to that. We just carried on doing it, rang our own boat, and really, at the end of the day, that's what stopped uh, us losing any... any we closed that Ridgeville. Um, Moyeni is looking good. SAPs, so you start, we started to see the, the turn now on the Tuesday already. You already see, look at, so Tuesday, at, it's only 43 um, WhatsApps by, by that. So things are a lot, a lot, a lot calmer. Um, on Tuesday evening, 50 taxi drivers uh, arrived to protect the Mall of Tembisa. Um, our head of security had to retreat out of Chris Honey Crossing, had run out of ammunition, um, and we decided it, we, we, we could do no more in Chris Honey Crossing. Um, I was nonstop with SAPs in SANDF, POP, and everyone else trying to mobilize, trying to get the guys going. Um, this was when my lack of military training suddenly, yeah, I became, I, I wish I'd had military training, but we learned very quickly. Uh, we had mobilized on that Tuesday. We'd put up riot fencing. We had created double barriers around the entire Mall of Timbisa. We had credi credible information that they were coming for us extremely hard at, at Mall of Timbisa. Our flagship mall, 45,000 square meters, uh, we'd opened it in 2020. And I'm very, very proud to, proud to say, as of yesterday, it was awarded the best new development, retail development in Africa um, at the International Property Awards. Um, and having been just finished at the end of 2020, it obviously hasn't paid off a dime of debt, of, of debt at the moment. Had that gone down, it would have been catastrophic for our business. So we threw everything we, we, we could. We'd, as you can see there, we put up this, this tricor razor wire um, barriers around us. Um, and at the end of the day, though, it wasn't just the barriers. Um, this was a critical thing. Um, we had informants in the community, in the meetings, this red faction, in the meetings that, was, that were explaining how they were going to come and hit us. And so we knew that on Tuesday night, just after dark, they were going to come and hit us at, at, um, at the Mall of Tembisa. Um, and at 5.30, we got the terrible news that the main pop, public order policing, ammunition and firearm depot, the armory in Kempton Park, the guy in charge of the armory, had locked it had left and had turned his phone off. So the entire pop that was in the area had no access to further ammunition, further weapons, because the armory had been locked for whatever known reason. But, they, but what we did know is that they were coming at us in Mall of Tembisa, and there were people that didn't want that mall to stand. The first shots were fired at the Mall of Tembisa at 7.38. And this came off Twitter. This is at our mall or at that time. I'll get Gigi to, to translate. That was the, that, that was the taxi association arriving um, and, and firing off warning shots, trying to dissuade the guys from coming. Waikala is crying it's as you're shooting, as you're shooting. And uh, uh, Banchwe, Gigi will correct me, but it means literally you must kill them, you must kill them. Um, something along those lines. We locked in about, we had about 130 guns on site at the Mall of Tembisa, knowing the threat was coming. Um, we had four tactical teams plus about 60, 70 of the taxi guys uh, on site. Um, and we literally knew if they took Timbisa down, it would, be, it, would, it would likely be the end of us. Um, so we threw everything we had at it. Um, more good news, the, the SAPs and the taxi ocean associations at, at, at Paulamore were protecting. That's up in the old Kwanda Bele. Uh, 6.59, the looting continued. And then, as expected, at 20 past eight, the siege of Timbisa began. Just like everywhere else, they start lighting fires in the distance. They start lighting fires to distract you. And we realized, as, the, as we had been warned, that, that they were coming. That's the, that's the township of Timbisa, the very informal settlement. We expected it to come from there. Um, and you, know, you just see that. You just see that. What you don't see is 
more. Maybe you can see it there in that photo. They're the, they're the instigators. With the fires behind them, they're announcing their arrival, and we, we knew it was going to be a long night, time to buckle down and get ready for, for what was to come. And then there was the, the, that photo in my mind. Will will go, will I'll die with that photo in my mind, knowing that you know those people looking at us and and literally in the back of my mind, seeing more of Timbisa going and seeing the, the the very strong possibility of our entire portfolio being collapsed by what it was our biggest development um, that had only just been completed and and having that thing burned to the ground. What followed was. Um, was mayhem, to be honest, uh, at the Mall of Timbisa. Uh, these are just some of the comments that were on on the group, um, just saying that they, you know, we it's starting, um, and we had expected it. But obviously, everyone in the company, it was like a shot to the heart because we just knew how critical this one was for us. Um, and they started at the at the cash build yard, and like everywhere else, they target the pump house our fire suppression systems, just as we had thought. We had we'd actually put up um, um, double right, right fencing around that um, to, try and, to try and protect that. Um, we managed to extinguish the fires. The guys are shooting at us or us at them both. Um, and, and that was the reality. It was, it was, we were getting shot at flat out all the, all the time. Um, fortunately, we, we did get managed to get a significant amount of pop and saps um, back up. We had police choppers assisting. Um, and this was one of the malls where we actually managed to keep a lot of the, of the saps there. Uh, as Gigi said, you know, Quaka Quaka Ball, the Quaka Fontaine Taxi Association, amazing partners of ours. That mall is now 25, 26 years old. They've been with us since the beginning. They put their own, their own in garbage. They put their own security guys at our gates with shambox, with guns. So anyone coming to or from the mall knew that if they tried to mess around, the taxi association, and we, 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 we were on paying these guys, guys. You misunderstand. Like, like Gigi said, they, the taxi association is, is a business. You know, and they are invested in in transaction capitals, um, SA Taxi. And they realized that if, if, their, if the malls went down, their businesses would be affected. They would end up repossessing a lot of the taxis, which they just leveraged, that they leveraged buy into, into SA Taxi, in, into transaction capital as Sintaka. Um, they'd be, when I, when I spoke to the, the head of Sintaka, and he said, Justin, this was a business, business decision. You know, if we had to repossess, if, if all the malls went down, we'd repossess 85% of the taxis, we would be in a financial hole we would never get out of. Um, and that's why we instructed our guys. It's time to 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 get involved. 2118. Um, we had managed to repel the 70 to 100 people that were coming at us um, with the you know that was that first wave coming at with the guns and everything else, uh, and they'd moved moved off. We'd expected that they would come back. Um, tw quarter to 10. Alex Moore was quiet. There was some positive. United we rise. Deep cliff, they were saluting us, looting us. We had teams in there welding the gate shut again, despite everything else going on, to make sure that we could try and protect what we had left. Um, message from me, which was <laughs> a mall of Timisa, quite currently, currently quiet. Oh, this is a little bit. Um, the looters arrived again at the mall of Timbisa. Uh, so we, we arrested these outside the mall of Timbisa. They were not, they were not local. I'm just going to leave it at that, not say anything further than that. Uh, Kotale Square at 818. Uh, the local taxi association arrived to protect us there. Um, and on Wednesday, 11.55, where you saw Leanne uh, interviewing Alex, we took the decision to open Alex Mall as a show of strength. Because as Lucky said, if they can't take us out at night, what chance do they have in the day? And if we remain closed, we show weakness. And I trust my center manager. I said, Lucky, if that's what you believe, you open. Because we were the last mall standing in the entire Alex. We were the last services, no pharmacies, no nothing. Um, and when social development came to, to, to see us after all this, they had no idea how they were going to pay out grants. Because now every single post office, every single ATM, every single bank in the entire Alexandra had been absolutely decimated but for our mall. Um, and just like the cues that Gigi um, showed you earlier, and some of them were, were, were mine when I was chatting to him um, during COVID with the cues in our parking lots, was how do we deal with these numbers of people under a pandemic who are now going to descend onto the mall because we're the last one standing? Um, we continued because we heard we knew that the, the threats weren't, weren't over at, at the Mall of Timbisa, um, and we, 
we started to fortify. This is important. I want to show you something here. I don't know if this thing is going to show. If you, if you kind of look here, in the middle of that, you can see these trenches. Now, when we, when we developed the Mall of Tembisa, the, the people heard we were coming. And so the first thing, as soon as they heard the mall was coming, is they would arrive with buckies at night. They would have a, the four walls of a tin shack on the back of the bucket. They would put up the tin shack and try and sleep there one night. As soon as they slept there one night, they're a resident. You have to now go and pay them compensation to get off. So we were getting inundated and having to every night try and get these guys off. So thought, we thought we were very clever. We were very clever uh, in, in the context. And we got a track excavator to dig a massive trench so that the buckies couldn't get on and, and, and put, their, put the tin shacks up. But what we didn't do is we didn't close it up. And so when this happened, all we had was like First World War trench warfare. Uh, we had this entire mound with a trench in, and these guys now shooting at us from inside the trench, and we couldn't get, ba we couldn't get back into them. So what we did is in the next day, we, we, we got graders in. We graded that entire perimeter around the, the, the Tembisa Mall, uh, Mall of Tembisa, to, to flatten it out. And that was just a video that came through from, from the work that was being done. We put up additional, um, additional right wire around. Um, we, we brought in additional fire protection. And for someone who's never been in the military to give this kind of an instruction that we built a sniper tower effectively um, out of bricks from the cash build yard so that our guys could sit in there and, and, and literally as they were coming because this was to protect our fire suppression system right next to our fire suppression system where we realized if they got hold of that when the fire started we wouldn't be able to pick, put, put them out. And then we burnt the felt, we cleared everything else so and then you'll come, I'll show you shortly now. Um, we sent out a media appeal. It's the first, we, we don't do a lot of press releases. We are a fairly private company, but we were literally at the end of everything. With a lack of staff support, and we knew the extent of what was coming at us, we actually put out a press release, and Alec helped give it a bit more air time um, to really appeal to SAPS and SANF to, to come and help us, and it certainly did seem to help. Um, strangely enough, at 17, 18, um, the SAPS and the flying squad was called away from them all to go and protect the highways. Um, I spent over 200,000 Rand on food um, over those couple of days, feeding SAPS, feeding SANDF, feeding my security, feeding my taxis, um, because I knew three meals a day, if we could keep them fed, we could keep them with energy drinks, we could keep them engaged there, um, we had some hope of keeping a presence large enough to deter anything um, further. And thank God the, the blue lights remained with us. We had numerous guys trying to get intel. We had bogus SANDF, we had bogus uh, TRT teams to come and trying to say they're coming to help us. They were looking for information, they were looking for weak spots, how they were going get, to get into us. Um, we put the additional fencing up, we put up emergency floodlights. Um, around the entire perimeter of the, the Mall of Tembisa so that we could actually see the guys coming in. Because like Alex, as I'd said, the guys were shoot, we, all we could do was shoot at, at, at where the muzzle, muzzle flashes were coming from. We, we couldn't see them. So what I said is, you know, I want the outside our per perimeter to look like the Sydney cricket ground um, on, on, on a one-day international. So we put up these generators with these Apollo lights around the entire perimeter so that anyone crossing that, we had graded it now, we had burnt any of the bush, we would cut the bush. They had 250, 300 meters to, to come across open felt to come at us. Um, we had 100, 130 guns on site, 10 snipers on the roof, um, and we let the community know we didn't want to use those, those snipers, but... Um, and we were prepared to uh, at, the, at the end of it. I was so fatigued by this time. I was so pumped on adrenaline. Uh, it was literally like, you know, you lose all sense and sensibility. All you're thinking now is survival because you're living in what is effectively we were in a state of war. Um, whether it was right, whether it was wrong, what I knew that was happening to us was wrong. And so therefore we were willing to do at whatever it took. Fortunately, we didn't have to because we put up enough to, en enough to dissuade them from coming back. Um, and the question to me, so that's me, I've taken a photograph of my, my laptop, I'm sitting on my laptop uh, through, throughout every night watching the remote cameras, uh, guys asking me, is everything quiet? Yes. The worst was over. The worst was behind us. We had now lit up, as I say, this entire area like daylight. We had put riot fencing all the way around. We had so much presence on site. We had so many people on site. Blue lights, SANDF, anyone coming for us, it would have been, it, 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 it would have made international news, I think, because it would have been, um, you know, as I say, it would have made Marikana look like a Sunday school picnic. 
Um, and as I say, very glad that we didn't have to, but sometimes, you know, the, you know, if you want peace, you have to prepare for war. Um, and that's exactly what we had to do. Um, at half past eight, um, I sent a photo, this photo to, to my team because everyone was so panicking about more of Timbisa. Um, and I just sent them the, the picture of, there you can actually see the, on, on, on the, on the, back left the second ring of that right fencing that goes around our, our water tanks and everything and and just the effect of the lightning between us and the informal settlement in Tembisa um, and I've added this because it's my brother makes a very interesting comment here a very important comment um, we got the community in to defend them all of Tembisa um, and this was a message from Sanko that Dipcliffe had been cleaned, and my brother, still under duress, sent the, that message. The rebuild begins. Because as hard as it was seeing what was happening, we knew that the rebuild was always going to happen, it always needed to happen, because as patriotic South Africans, too much depends on these malls standing, these malls being brought back to life. And so... <laughs> That's the same mall that was two days before, a day before, was absolutely overrun. There was just, you, you, you couldn't see the park in the paving for all the mess and, and everything, everything else. And that was the community that came, uh, and, and Sanko and the community came and helped us uh, clean it. And as I responded to my brother, wow, amazing news, spot on, the tide has turned after almost 72 hours of unimaginable duress, stress, and anarchy. At 20 to 10, the, the pop was there in support at Mall of Tembisa. We were pretty sure that everything was over. This is the last slide of the 72 hours of anarchy just after midnight. Um, I sent photos, taking a photograph of my laptop. All is quiet, and then I was finally knocking off um, for the night, was the I would like to say it was the first time that I could get some sleep. I didn't sleep anything, and Alec interviewed me the next day. Um, and I had, uh, even though I went to bed probably at one o'clock, you know, you're looking at your phone every every hour to see if 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 there's been messages coming through. Um, but that was the end of the 72 hours of anarchy. I've obviously had to cut out a lot of information um, that that happened in in between uh, a lot of the other tweets but I hope it gives you some sort of an indication. This is a little thing done by Brian, one of our local tenants in, in Ezekeni. It's the last, effectively the last slide. <laughs> <laughs>